Welcome guys to episode 7 of the Relationship Series. Uh, I always say I'm excited every week, but uh, I'm excited again. This week I've got joining me Garrett Kramer, who's the founder of Inner Sports. Um, Garrett's um, a consultant and provides management services in the athletics area. He, he works with athletes, coaches, business leaders. Some of his clients uh, include Olympians, um, but he works from you know, people in high school, collegiate players, and, and works in a number of number of sports. And himself was a collegiate ice hockey player. Um, Garrett has written a book um, called uh, Still Power, which I highly recommend. Um, he's also been on a number of uh, TV and radio shows, uh, ESPN, he's been on Fox, um, he's been uh, interviewed in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, Sports Illustrated, Forbes, um, and he's got a new book coming out called The Path of No Resistance, Why Overcoming is Simpler Than You Think. Hi, Garrett. Hey, Kush, what's up, buddy? Hey. Yeah, I... I I love having you on, on the call and, and I just want to give a, that's kind of, I guess, the formal introduction, but I, I would love the listeners to, to know who you are for me. So I, I met Garrett two years ago, um, just over two years ago, and, and I didn't really know anything about you. I knew kind of the, the, the formal bio, if you like, that, that I've just read out. Um, but I, I went to a, to a course um, for three days, and all, all I knew that Garrett was a, um, an expert, if you like, in, in peak performance or, 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 or sports performance or, or something like that. But I, I didn't really know what to, what to expect. And over the three days, Garrett, whether he would realized it or not, kind of really challenged just the way I, I viewed the world. And... And I don't know if I, I, I felt like a bit slow because for the first day I didn't really understand what was going on. But by the second day, something started to click. And by the end of it, on the third day, I, I was a different person. And, and, I, and I think my life has never been the same since. So, uh, I, I, you know, Garrett, Garrett, I guess, was right at the start of my coaching journey and, um, and was a huge impact on me. And, and uh, I'm, um, I'm really happy to, to have Garrett on board for, for this interview. Well, I'm overwhelmed, but I'm overwhelmed. That's very nice of you to say, but so thank you, thank you. No, no problem. So, Garrett, um, you you work in the sports arena, and um, this uh, this series of interviews is is about relationships. Um, I would just love it, like, just for us to start off with and, and get your views on on how important relationships are in in the in the arena of sports and, and sports performance? Well, it's a loaded question because obviously you know that they're important, I suppose, right? So um, I think I think probably what you're getting at is that the same dynamics that are at play in a, a uh, relationship, a personal relationship, whether it be a couple or just friends, whatever, those same relationships are at play um, in the athletic arena. And um, obviously in a team setting, they're at play uh, between the coach and his or her team, the, the, then, then and then between the members of the team. In an in individual sport, you'd be amazed that their teams you know, it looks like a Rory McIlroy or a Roger Federer are kind of out there on their own, but they have teams behind them. I was just on a conference call this morning. I'm part of a team for one of my PGA players. You know, on that call was obviously the player. It was his swing coach, his strength coach, and me. Um, so in, in, in sports, just like in anything else, these you know, relationships and kind of knowing – the driving factors behind relationships, productive relationships, are are just are, are essential. Um, and I find I find that in my work, if you look at let's just take players, let's say in in hockey, a sport I do a lot of work in. Um, if you look at the, the, 
players that have stable relationships at home, at home, um, you know, uh, stable, you know, relationships with their wives, for example, with their parents. It seems it's across the board where that that perspective on relationships carries on. You, you see those players having the good relationships with their teammates, with their coaches, with their management, with fans. So it's just not – you can't kind of parse where your relationships are, are productive or not. People who generally get it have good relationships across the board where people who don't understand the dynamics behind a quality relationship, they're going to struggle in any relationship. And, and that's why – what you're doing here is so important. That's so interesting. I, I hadn't really even seen it in that way before. And it's so interesting because I, I'm based in the UK and we've got a number of, you know, the biggest sport over here is, is, is football. And, you know, the number of things that come up in the papers about kind of the football stars and, and problems they have, have off the pitch. Um, and interestingly, you're right that actually when, when things seem to blow up there, quite often, now that I think about it, that their performance suffers suffers on the pitch as well. Um, and, and I'm guessing you you would say, because I know you don't work just only in sports, I'm, I'm guessing you'd say that happens in you know other areas of your life as well. Right. The, you know, it's funny. Very often you'll hear in sports or in business or in anything, you'll hear... Let's say in sports, your commentators say something like, well, the field is is his uh, safe haven. You know, that's the place where he or she can go out and just let go and, and forget the troubles of the world. But there, there, it, there's no proof of that whatsoever. You'll find that people who lack understanding about life and how your experience is shaped, which we can talk about, um, they, you can't lack that in one area of life. You either lack it or you don't. Now we do create habits and some habitual behaviors that, that play out <clears throat> in some areas more than others. That's, that's fine. That's true. But, but overall, overall, you're going to find that people who are struggling, the struggles relate back to what's creating their feelings, what's creating their experience. Where is that coming from? It's, it looks like it's coming from outside. Well, that's not the case. And it will look like it's coming from the outside on the football pitch, at the dinner table, in a meeting with their with their agent, um, in interaction with the media. It'll play out across the board. It just does. It just does. You can't understand in one area of life and not understand the other. That would be looking that would that would be totally contrary to the basic premise that um, circumstances are pretty much irrelevant. <laughs> you feel your thinking, you don't feel your circumstances. That means we can't seem to get on better in one circumstance than the other. There's just a general, it just kind of spreads itself out. And, and you'll see it. You'll see a player who is struggling and down on his luck. And sure enough, his marriage is falling apart. But then people who don't know will say, oh, he's struggling on the field because his marriage is falling apart. Or he's struggling with his marriage because his play on the field is so bad. And, and again, it all comes back to understanding, uh, you know, a level of understanding of where your feelings come from. And that kind of governs everything. So, I mean, I know a little bit about your, your, your background, but I would love for you to share a little bit about kind of how you got here. Cause, cause I know you, you didn't always see this and, and you didn't always uh, understand this and, and, and that's changed over, over the years. Yes. I, well, I see it every day, as you can relate, you know, we see it more, Hankish, right? So every day when we, especially when you do this work and when you look in this direction constantly, you really, you know, every day consciousness is growing. And so I see it more. But there was a time in my life over 20 years ago where I would have insisted that any any pain I was feeling or not only pain, any um, any happiness I was feeling was coming from my life situation. So whatever was happening on the outside was kind of driving driving my state of mind. That that's what I believe to be true. That's a that's something that um, was drilled into me, and I just kind of accepted as as right and. 
um, kept chasing on the, on the sports field, kept chasing perfection. Um, in my relationships, the same. Uh, in my business, the same. And um, as you know, one day, um, as a result of that just total misunderstanding, I found myself in a real low place, lower than low, and I couldn't get out of it. And that persisted and got worse and worse for better part of a year. And um, finally, I, I said to myself, I, you know, you kind of got two choices here. You could either take a gun to your head and end it or I, I should say what I was doing to try to feel better was I was, I was uh, going to therapy. I was reading self-help books. I was in uh, yoga class trying to meditate. Um, I was medicate, <laughs> take, taking um, not illegal medi. I was taking prescription uh, SSRIs. Um, I was um, just doing everything in my power to find the way to feel better. And as I said, I, I was stepping on the gas pedal with my tires in mud. I was just getting worse. So it finally hit a point where, where as I said, I decided, you know, either end it now or until you can find the real reason why you're feeling low. And again, I still thought that was circumstantial. I didn't think that that was some, that was inside of me, but and the cure for feeling low, again, I thought that was outside. Why don't you just stop trying so darn hard because it's not working? Well, I decided to, to stop trying, not, you know, not try so hard. And as I took my foot off the gas pedal, the amazing thing was I, I started to come out of my funk. And it, it happened week by week, um, day by day, week by week, month by month. And by the couple months later, I'm just feeling fantastic. And the crazy thing, what I noticed was, you know, nothing's changed on the outside. My past is still my past. My biology is still my biology. My um, economic situation is still my economic situation. My physical situation is still the physical. Everything was identical. Yet, I, would, I felt great. And it dawned on me, and I didn't say it like this at the time, but what dawned on me was that the mind is designed to self-correct. My mind was designed to fix itself. I was just getting in its way. And when I got out of the way, it, it kicked in. And again, I didn't explain it that clearly back then, but I don't know how else to explain it now. So I don't remember how I explained it, but that's how I would explain it now. And and that that understanding led me on just in a crazy, a crazy, just a, a path of total uh, serendipity where uh, my wife, who my fiance at the time, my wife then, shortly thereafter and to this day, um, was reading a book called Don't Sweat the Small Stuff written by Richard Carlson. I got to know Richard. I reached out to Richard. I got to know Richard. Rich, Richard introduced me to George Pransky, introduced me to Keith Blevins, introduced me to Dick and all the people that you, you know, that you, you've talked to and you know. And and that and and those people, those guys, mainly Keith and George, they put my revelation into context for me. They 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 really did it. Well, first Richard Carlson did that. Then, then George and Keith. And um, I've maintained these relationships ever since. Um, it was about three years after I first met Keith and George, which I, I said to them, I'm going to start a company called Inner Sports, and I'm going to teach this inside-out understanding to athletes and coaches because the sports world is in, is in drastic need of it. And I remember George telling me, that's a great idea, but you're not ready yet. <laughs> and I said, I don't care what you think. I'm doing it. So, I'm <laughs> So, um, and it's funny, I think that after a couple of years of, of, of doing okay and, and, and getting going, then George finally got behind what I was doing and it was really cool, but I, he was probably right. I really wasn't ready yet, but, um, you know, when you kind of see it, you see it. And when you know it, you know it. And I was just, nothing was going to stop me. Um, and I, you know, I threw away my old career and started this, this business and I've been at it ever since. So yeah, that's the. That's the quick version of how I got here, but cool. And you know, I I, uh, I I've heard the story before. I I love listening to it again. And 
and what's coming up, I guess, in the context of this interview as well is that you, you first came to this when you were, you were engaged. And, and, and I'm really curious to see how this, this understanding's pay, played out in your marriage and, and now with your, with, your, with your children as well. Well, um, first of all, I, I got incredibly lucky, although it's probably not as much luck as, as it may sound. And, and, and that is that my wife, um, Liz, um, she, she couldn't teach what I teach for anything. She, she, she could, she, she it, when she tries, she fumbles over the words. However, she is just blessed with a purity of understanding that is just rare. So for whatever reason, which is very interesting. Um, life didn't shroud her innate wisdom like it did mine. You know, she just, and there's no reason for that. And if we look for one, we're going to miss it. And I'm sure you've been telling me, we talked, you've talked about that before, but, um, and so it was really Liz who, and it's why I was so attracted to her. I think now I, I've been, we've known each other for a long time. When we were kids, we knew each other. So, I've been attracted to her for a long time and, and all that, but I, I'm mainly attracted to her, to that about her. She's just so genuine and real and gets over things. And, um, yeah, I mean, so, so that's, that's the first thing. I mean, I just got lucky and, and I found a, a, a wife, a partner who just had that. Right. And one of the things that I'll, I'll tell you, I, I believe that for a relationship to, to really uh, flourish, all you need is one at the beginning. Like you don't need both. Both partners don't have to have such purity of understanding. But if you have one that's at least looking in this direction, even if they don't know they're looking, I think that's a start. I think that's a start. And I really believe that at the end of the day, you can I could talk about Richard Carlson and Keith and George and everybody. But at the end of the day, Liz was the catalyst for it all. She was the catalyst for er everything, for my ability to, to change. Because I think if I had, if I had, if I had been engaged to or was living with a partner who was as backwards thinking as I was, outside and as I was, this could have been a disaster because it just would have fed it. She didn't, Liz didn't have any time for my belly aching about my past or my experience or everything. She just didn't, she didn't engage in that kind of nonsense. It's not that she told me to shut my mouth or anything, but <laughs> she just didn't have time for it. And it was obvious to me that it's like, yeah, well, why doesn't she have time for it? I remember talking to Keith about this years ago, and it was just so amazing. So that was just lucky for me. Um, listen, as far as under, as my, my marriage, with that said, assuming that I'm right, and both Liz and I over the years have possessed a, a relatively, um, a, you know, a relatively good level of understanding, high level of understanding, it doesn't mean that there's times where we don't miss it and we don't get in our own way. So in my new book, I write about a time, this, this will be funny, I wrote about a time when um, I came home and I was all up in my own head, not feeling great. And, you know, a lot of noise upstairs. And uh, I asked Liz, walked in the door, asked Liz, what's for dinner? And and it was a time where I was trying to watch my diet. So I was trying not to eat a lot of red meat. So Liz says meatballs. She said meatballs. So I said, uh, and I remember I'm in a, I'm in a real, I'm not, I'm not seeing life clearly at all right now. So I felt really insecure. And she says meatballs. And I said, how could you make meatballs? You know I'm trying to you know, watch my red meat intake. How could you do that to me? Like I'm taking it all personal. She's making me. And now that just goes to show you how you could just, you just not, I'm just not seeing it, you know? And she, she doesn't engage me at all. As a matter of fact, she says, not listening, like not listening. That's what she said to me. And I said, again, meatballs, babe, come on. I mean, that's just wrong. Blah, 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 blah. And again, not listening. So I kind of got a hold of myself. I got the hint. My head started to clear because I didn't go down this road for too long. I sat down at the table. I started eating the meatballs and they tasted a little different. So I said, what, what is this? 
turkey meatballs. <laughs> they were turkey meatballs. But I couldn't, at that, when, when I'm all jammed up, the prospect that Liz is considering my diet and looking out for me didn't even occur that that was a possibility. I took offense to meatballs. And it's just, a, you know, turkey meatballs. It just was, it's hilarious how, how when you don't see it, you're not seeing it. But anyway, the moral of the story is that there's many times in our relationship where one or one of us is not, at, you know, we just aren't seeing it in the moment. We're struggling. And knowing, knowing that those struggles are not coming from the behavior of the other person is the ultimate ace in the hole for our, our marriage. It doesn't mean there's not a time I, I may look at Liz and like say to myself, how did I get myself into this mess? How did I marry this person, you know, 23 years later? <laughs> but, and I'm sure vice versa, but at the end of the day, we understand that our, that our feelings are coming from the ebbs and flows of our own thinking. And when thinking ebbs, the world out there is going to look a little blurry, a little skewed, even the love of my life. Even the love of my life is going to look that way. When thinking flows, she looks different. Her behavior looks different. Everything about her looks different. And, and again, that, that goes for her perspective on me as well. And knowing that, again, really is our saving grace. Um, anytime I work with a couple or and I don't, any type of relationship, any type of relationship, it is amazing how that is always, always 100% that's the source. That's the source of the strife. Whereas the couple, the couple trying to battle through the, the strife, they're taking the strife as a symptom of all these problems when the problems are a symptom of the strife. And that is, is totally backwards in couple therapy today or any type of mediation setting. People are out there trying to work on the problems, the turkey meatballs, the meatballs, instead of the state of mind that caused our perception of the meatballs. So the meatballs are never the issue. Even if they were meat, red meat, as my consciousness rose, as my head cleared, I would probably understand that Liz has got a busy life too. She just spaced out innocently. She just forgot. And I wouldn't take it personal. I would, I would, she did the best she could. She was she doing the best they could to feed me, you know. So it would, even if they were red meat, it would have still made sense to me. And again, the meatballs are not the issue, ever the issue. The level of consciousness is the issue. And as soon as that rises, perspective on the meatballs, the problems always changes. Usually the problems just disappear. And you asked about my children, and the same understanding goes for my relationships with my children, Liz's relationships with our children, and the relationships between our children. So I, I believe that Liz and I, I mean, our kids are now, are now older, they're 22, 20, and 17, and our, I believe that Liz and I have set a foundation, a foundation of this understanding. And not through our words so much, but just how we live our lives and how we treat each other. I believe that has, to a large extent, rubbed off on my, my three children. Um, and I'm proud of that, actually. And it's not a matter of sitting down and teaching the three principles to my children. I don't even, never, that's never been done in our house. Never once. Um, it's a matter of um, living it. It's a matter of living it. And when, when we miss it, apologizing for it <laughs> because we're going to miss it sometimes we're going to miss it sometimes and you know i i believe that in in my life i will say that the fuzziest area where i or, or the, the, the the area where i miss it the most is when it comes to my children where i miss where my feelings are coming the most is when it comes to my kids um so it's a it's a sticky one for 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 even me on that front yeah, I I, uh, I I recall back one thing that one thing that stuck with me. I guess after after even two years is a a story that you told about about your daughter when she catches you out. Oh yeah, yeah, she's good at that. <laughs> she's my youngest, and she yeah, she'll she'll tell me to read my books. You know, go read your books, Daddy, because 
they're just <laughs> yeah it's like i may miss it or something get a little, little excited and um yeah and she doesn't want to hear it and she'll say go read go read your books i'll tell you a funny situation with my that's worth mentioning with my daughter i may have discussed this with hank on a, on a different call um uh, you know, one of the and one of the areas my wife misses it. She doesn't miss it miss it with the boys as much as she will with Chelsea, my daughter, our daughter. Um, and I find that every now and then they'll they'll get in a little bit of a, a tiff, and it will always play out like, um, you know, honey, we need to talk about this. And Chelsea will say to Liz, I don't want to talk about this. And Liz will say, but we have to talk about this. We've got to discuss it. We've got to work it out. And Chelsea will say, I told you I don't want to talk about this. And then Liz will say, don't be disrespectful. And then Chelsea will say, I'm not being disrespectful, mom. I just don't want to talk about it right now. And then, yeah, yeah. So this is kind of how it goes. And, you know, what's interesting is that it, it really explains a lot, that type of that type of interaction, because if Chelsea is struggling, intuitively, intuitively, she knows that discussing things is not going to help. Why is it not going to help? Because she's going to add more thought into her head. And she doesn't want to discuss it. She doesn't want to add more thought into her head. She knows, again, intuitively, that that's just counterproductive. So now, Liz wants Chelsea to be okay, wants to fix things for her daughter. Nothing wrong with that. But she doesn't, it, it, so she misses in the moment that Chelsea's not ignoring her, not being disrespectful. She just doesn't want to go there right now because she knows that when her head clears, the answers are just going to fill the space. And and fact of the matter, the same dynamic is at work behind the scenes in Liz's head. As soon as her head clears, the answers for Chelsea will fill the space. And no one's going to get anywhere by sitting there discussing it, discussing the problem, because the problem is not the problem. The outside is not the problem. The lack of clarity is the problem. And until that sets in, we're not going to get anywhere. So it's just an interesting dynamic that, of course, that dynamic is at work in any interpersonal relationship and we just we just kind of got to remember so it's my role actually there to kind of remind liz what's it what's going on there um and and to not point chelsea in a direction actually where sitting there and airing out your problems is an answer because there's so many now, now luckily chelsea knows better than to buy into what liz is saying right so she knows and, and, and there's, but there's, but I, I was the opposite when I was 17. So my a coach or my father would say to me, we're going to talk about this. We're going to sit down. I remember we sit down, we're going to talk about this. So I bought in that that was the, th that way to find answers, you know, delve into the problem. And no wonder I never found answers <laughs> because again, from, you know, the problem is never out there. The problem was, is in your lack of clarity in the moment. And you can't get clear by discussing your problems. Now, maybe you 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 can get clear while you are discussing your problems, but that's just a coincidence. That's got nothing to do with it, the discussion itself. And that's what a lot of the therapists miss. Like they'll have a couple in, and then they'll have at the problems, and for whatever reason, the couple will walk out feeling better, but. Then they next week they come in and we have out the problems again and they feel worse and then they feel worse the next week. And we don't realize that that first week it was just kind of a, a coincidence that consciousness randomly kicked in and all these troubles seemed to melt away and the couple started getting affectionate towards each other. But and, and it's never that it's just it was a coincidence, a timing thing. And we kind of missed that that's what's going on, but that's that that's what happened. So. Yeah, I, I, so I can't remember. Someone told me that the vast majority of couples therapy isn't successful, and um, it kind of points to to what you're saying. And you know, I, I love the simplicity of, of of how you you say what you say and how it's it, it's sometimes the opposite of of what we think. It's you know, we don't feel bad because of what's going on. 
sometimes we just feel bad and because of that we don't perform very well in the outside world uh, and how we always see it the other way around. Right. I mean, I remember a couple of years back, I was called to mediate a problem in uh, an American football on an American football team between the new uh, the new star of the team and the existing coach. So this guy was new on the team. He's played somewhere else. Um, I don't remember if he was traded for, but somehow he ended up on this team. And the season was about to start, and the coach and the player could were were at at odds, total odds. And it was playing out like a, a, a Greek tragedy in the in the media here in the States. And I got a call from the GM and I remember he picked me up at the airport. I was gonna spend the day with the team. And I got in the car and he said, I got us all set. We got the they've got, they've already had practice. We've got the conference room and the four of us, we got it all day, and we're gonna stay in that conference room until we hash out the problems. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I said, listen, um, I'm going to tell you what we're going to do. And if this doesn't, this, this doesn't suit what you, you know, you just take me right back to the airport because this is what we're going to do. I'm going to sit with the coach and I'm going to take as much time as I need, just the two of us. And when I'm done, I'm going to sit with the player and I'm going to take as much time as I need. When I'm done with the player, you need to take me back to the airport. He says, that's it. I said, that's it. That's all I'm going to do. Now, so what was behind all that? Well, just what we said, obviously sitting in a room and hashing out your problems would never pay dividends in my mind. It, you're, again, you're, you're, the problems are a symptom of low levels of consciousness low levels of understanding and there's no way we can elevate consciousness by delving into problems. So we're, the problems aren't even real problems. They're just symptoms. So it's kind of like swinging at the air, fighting a paper tiger, whatever. You're not going to get anywhere. Now, so what did I, what did I do in these meetings with the player and the coach? Well, I didn't even talk about the, the, the other party. I didn't even talk about the relationships. All I talked about was the principles that govern the human experience, how it is we create our, you know, where our feelings come from moment to moment and how, how, how thought shapes our experience, not how what happens out there causes our feelings, et cetera. So in a simplistic way to say it is, you know, your, your state of mind creates your experience. Your experience doesn't create your state of mind. Once that is understood by player and coach, naturally, as they stop looking to the outside world to explain their inner feelings, naturally, they're going to start to feel better. So the only reason that we struggle is because we are looking, we, we, we are looking outside to explain what's going on on the inside. And the minute we look in that direction, we feel worse. We, we, we feel worse because that's not, it's not true. You're chasing something that's not, this is not true. You know, so as the, as the individuals separately start to look inside, there's another way to say it, naturally, naturally, they start to self-correct. Just what happened to me over 20 years ago. It's exactly the same dynamic. And as they start to self-correct, their perspective on, on life, the perspective on the world out there, including each other, starts to change. So that's all that's at work. And of course, and, and as that happened, I just got lucky. They, they kind of both saw it. And they met the next morning on the field and had a great, they lost in the Super Bowl that year, that team. And both, and the, I think the coach was up for coach of the year and the player was in, in the MVP running. I mean, it was a great season. And they, they continue to this day to have a great relationship. It is fantastic. And again, it, we didn't even discuss problems or each other. We just talked about how the human mind ebbs and flows and how when thought kind of flows in there, 
the world out there looks a little blurry, just like my wife and the meatballs. And how as, as thought kind of escapes, we start, start, we start to understand. And it's got nothing to do with the actions of others. And as people start to see that, they just, th those people who do see it, I should say, just tend to have um, enduring and meaningful relationships. Whether it's just meeting someone on the street, at a party, uh, whatever, or lifelong relationships, whatever it is. And, and I, I just think it's just a, it's just those of us who are lucky enough to even consider that to be true are, are the lucky ones. Like we're just lucky that we, we were introduced to something that is just that nobody knows about. As you said, it's always the opposite of what you think. And I will tell you on that, Ankush, that I told us one of my kids the other day, we were talking about something and, and I don't remember what it was, but I said, just if everyone's saying it, it's not true. <laughs> if everyone's <laughs> saying it, it's not true. You know, I remember George Pransky once asked me to send him a couple of my articles. This is years ago. And I, I just didn't really give it much consideration. I, what I did was I, I, I searched my articles and I searched for the articles that were the most tweeted. Okay. So I sent George these two articles that had gotten 150, whatever it was. I don't remember. Tweets, a lot of tweets. And he called me up maybe that night. He says, Garrett, I got to talk to you. Typical George, I got to talk to you. What, what, George? What's up? So those articles sucked. <laughs> I said, what? Those are my most tweeted articles. He goes, Tomorrow morning, first thing, I want you to send me the least tweeted articles because those are the ones that are going to be great. And he was so right. He was, it was crazy. It, I mean, I had it. I just didn't see it for a second. I just got caught up in this outside in nonsense of tweeting. And that means something like that has some significance. And he was so right. The articles that people, that only a couple people got, right? But, and, and those are the articles that I was speaking truth which makes sense if you think about it, because it, it takes a person to be at the right place and the right time to recognize truth. And people who are caught up in this outside in world we live in, they're not going to see it. And oh my gosh, was that an eye opener for me? That was just crazy. I, I, and he was so right about that. Now, of course, within you know the, the community has grown since then. So there's more people who now recognize what's what we're talking about. So it's a little different, but back then, man, was he right. Oh boy. And that's funny. I was going to use those articles as, as some kind of content for my new book. And I tossed them right away. Right away. <laughs> they were terrible. This is awful. I don't know. So, so thanks that Garrett. I, I'm, I'm really enjoying this and, and we could carry on talking for ages, but we we've run massively over time. So I think we're going to, unfortunately have to draw it to a close right there. Um, you said you've got a new book coming out. I'm, uh, I'm guessing your existing books on uh, on Amazon. It's called Still Power. If people want to get hold of you, how how might they be able to do that? Uh, well, they can get get hold of me through um, just I guess the easiest way. Just go to my website, which is my name GarrettKramer.com, and my email uh, information, phone numbers, and stuff is is all there. Yeah. So yeah, and the new book, the new book, The Path of No Resistance, is on Amazon also. So you oh, can great for that now too. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, don't. And I would just encourage people to feel free to reach out out to me. Don't be a stranger. Yeah, fantastic. And, and people can get hold of me as usual uh, via my website, uncushjane.co.uk, um, and on Facebook, facebook.com forward slash uncushjaneltd. It's been an absolute absolute pleasure, Garrett. And um, I'll speak to the listeners on the next episode. Thanks a lot. Thanks you. See you.